Hello and welcome back to The Determinants of Health. In this lecture, we're going to compare some of the world's healthcare systems. I want to start out with this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Now he's talking mostly about the American situation, but he might be just as well be talking about the global situation where if you cannot access health care, you pretty much have been disadvantaged for every other aspect of your life. And those who cannot access health care tend to be the most dispossessed and vulnerable in society. So the extent to which a nation can create a health care system that allows its most vulnerable and weak to become healthy is a sign that is taking steps towards truly equitable actions and the creation of a society that is more homogeneous when it comes to access to all the qualities of life. In the USA, at least 45 million people cannot afford health insurance. That's one of the reasons that Obamacare was brought into existence, the Affordable Care Act, to give an opportunity for the um, more vulnerable people to have access to health care. Why is this important? Well, because in the USA, uh, the major cause of personal bankruptcy is actually health care emergencies. So if you are a factory worker or a blue collar worker making, you know, not that much money, but enough to survive, and suddenly in your 40s or 50s, you get a heart attack and need bypass surgery, that's going to cripple you economically. Suddenly, you have to mortgage your house or sell your house, and for the rest of your life, you're paying off the debt of your medical emergency. So, medical emergencies tend to be one of the biggest barriers to personal, economic, and social progress. Therefore, socialized medicine, or at least uh, a responsive and equitable healthcare system, becomes even more paramount. So, what are the world's best healthcare systems and what are their characteristics? There have been a few attempts to quantify this question. And in 2000, the World Health Organization tried a fairly comprehensive, exhaustive analysis of all of the world's healthcare systems. And they used a series of indicators to rank those systems. When I give this talk, to the lay audience, I usually begin by asking them, if you were trying to assess the quality of a healthcare system, what indicators would you use? It's a question that most people never think about, and it comes down to a values assessment. What do you care about in your healthcare system? Do you care that you have a lot of choice? Do you care that you like your doctor? Do you care that you have doctors and nurses working side by side? Do you care that you don't have to pay out of pocket? Do you care that the suite of services available to you is broad and exhaustive? Do you care that the clinic that you go to is nearby? Do you care that there isn't a long waiting list for certain services? Do you care that there's parking in the building where you access your health care services? Do you care that uh, the blood services are in the same building as your doctor? All these things matter. At a larger level, how important is it that we have an affordable system? And how is that affordable system financed? Is it through taxation? Is it through uh, some other mechanism? Is it through out-of-pocket copayment? Does it matter how your physician or nurses are paid? Uh, salary versus other methods? Well, these are some of the issues that complicate our analysis of healthcare provision. I want to start out by mentioning what I mean by OECD, because I'll, I'll talk a little bit about OECD countries. OECD stands for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It's an organization, a club of about 30 countries who accept some fundamental principles about democracy and free market economy. In other words, these are the world's rich countries. So all the Western European countries, North American countries, Australia, Japan, these are considered to be OECD, or wealthy nations. One of the things that comes up when we discuss the indicators for assessing the quality of a healthcare system 
is something called healthcare system responsiveness. What is responsiveness? Well, responsiveness is a combination of patient satisfaction and how well a system acts. So I talked a second ago about all these things you might care about in your system. Uh, how many doctors are there? How long is the drive to the clinic? Well, some of that is a measurable, quantifiable thing, and some of that is more about your expectations socially. Do you care if your doctor looks like you, that there's gender diversity and racial diversity? Do you care that there's an environment in the waiting room that's child-friendly? Do you care that the wallpaper is pink or there's a TV? Um, any number of things could come to pass here about uh, how we measure satisfaction. But responsiveness, as a result, talks about not just the, the essential aim of the system, which is to provide health care, but about how that essential aim is contextualized in partnership with other social priorities like inclusiveness and respect and politeness uh, and those kinds of things. So in other words it's it's a combination of how the system responds with some of the other non-health aspects of life that may enhance care. Even something like is there a, a computerized system for getting access to the physician or managing the records or um, is your doctor available on Facebook or social media to answer questions? In other words, it's the way that individuals are treated and the environment in which they are treated. It's a complicated thing, this healthcare system responsiveness thing. Right? How do we measure it? Well, it's unclear, but um, in many cases you measure it through surveying user experiences, like uh, your most recent visit to the doctor in the past six months, rank it on a scale of one to five in terms of how enjoyable it was, how satisfied you were with the following experiences, uh, politeness, um, promptness of care, uh, comfort, welcomingness, those sorts of things. This is a, a fairly uh, complicated diagram that may make you more confused or add more clarity to your life, I'm not sure. But it attempts to show a framework for where responsiveness fits into our overall healthcare mandate. So we have an environment, resources, money, doctors. We have the way the health system is organized. That's you know, um, how much money is spent and where it's spent. And you have things like uh, how corrupt is your clinic and your, and your politics. Those are aspects of the environment. Then there are aspects of the population. So how educated are people? Um, what is their race, their SES? What are their values? And then all these things lead to responsiveness. And responsiveness, again, is a combination of these expectations of individuals with aspects of the environment. And also, of course, when and how they access the healthcare system. I don't know if this helps understand it. Uh, it may just confuse you further. Uh, if it does, just think about responsiveness as some combination of the patient experience and expectation with the actual delivery of care. So, in the WHO's analysis of healthcare systems, they landed upon four functions that a healthcare system must provide to its population. The first is service provision. That's pretty straightforward, right? Your healthcare system is supposed to give you health services. It's supposed to provide a hospital, a doctor, uh, maybe an ambulance, maybe a 911 emergency service, maybe a hotline you can call to get health care. Uh, something r r involving actually giving direct health care to individuals. It must involve resource generation. What is that? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. Must involve financing. In other words, how is all this paid for? Your healthcare system must incorporate a method for actually financing all this uh, incredibly expensive care. And lastly, this thing called stewardship, which I'll talk about for a second. But resource generation, what we're talking about here is does your healthcare system create doctors? Uh, it includes the medical education system. Does it include a process for buying medical devices like blood pressure monitors and, and things like that? Um, does your healthcare system, is it good at building hospitals and managing them? 
So it's creating resources for you to use. Stewardship is policy and regulation. So this quote kind of helps. Uh, the very essence of good government, the careful and responsible management of the well-being of the population. That's stewardship. So your healthcare system has a role to play in collecting data around your mortality rates, your uh, um, uh, nutrition rates, the illness rates, all those kinds of things that help us devise policy to make the population better. So these are the four functions of a good healthcare system that the World Health Organization felt were uh, important delimiters of a healthcare system. So what indicators did they use to make their rankings? All right, what would you do? Well, what they did was they looked at the overall level of population health. So how healthy is the population? You can measure that in a number of ways. You can look at longevity, which is the lazy but easy way. You can look at mortality rates. You can look at um, uh, BMI as a measurement of how well-fed a population is. All kinds of options. They looked at health inequalities within the population. In other words, is one group more unhealthy than another group? Are women less healthy than men? Are a certain ethnicity less healthy than another ethnicity? They looked at this thing called responsiveness again. How do you do that? Well, you, know, you survey the population, ask them about uh, how satisfied they were in their previous encounters. They looked at how responsiveness is distributed. So is it more responsive in some parts than others? They looked at the financial burden. Who's paying for it? Not just how much it costs, but is that cost being borne disproportionately by the poor, by the rich, by whom? But what about quality of care? Right? Interestingly, whenever I ask people about the indicators they would use to measure healthcare responsiveness, the last thing they think about is asking the people what they think about their healthcare system. That's responsiveness. Okay? So that's why it's important that I had that little conversation a second ago to talk about uh, what responsiveness is. It plays a large role in measuring the quality of a healthcare system. But this analysis did not take into consideration the quality of the care. How good is the actual care that you're getting? But another study that I'll talk about later on did take that in consideration. So, um, this should say what country topped the list, not why country topped the list. But okay, what country topped the list according to this WHO study from 2000? Da 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 da! It was France. France provides the best overall health care, and Italy and Spain were close on its heels. There's our stereotypical, possibly offensive rendition of a French person. Um, take that for what it is. So this is the list, the rankings, according to WHO, of the best healthcare systems. France was number one. So these countries here in the red, they all share a certain characteristic. They're essentially micronations, they're island states. Um, and small countries like that, really, it's not really fair to put them on this list, in my opinion, because they don't share the same economic and social demands as large countries do. They tend to export their demographic problems. They don't have the same population base to serve. So I would put those aside for a second. But look at the ones who made the top. France, Italy, the Western European nations. Where's Canada? Number 30. So we have a habit of singing the praises of our healthcare system quite loudly. And we should. It's a, it's a pretty good program. It's, it's served our needs well, in my opinion. Um, I would hate to think where we'd be without our healthcare system. However, it may not be the best possible system. Where are the Americans? They're down 37. This uh, map shows us um, visually where the best healthcare systems are. So the greener, the better, and the redder, the worst. Unsurprisingly, North America, Western Europe, and Australia have the best systems and Sub-Saharan Africa has the worst systems. Let's talk a second about France, because France topped our list of the best healthcare systems. Um, what's so special about France? Well, most people going to a doctor in France actually pay their doctor up front, 
and then they're reimbursed later. You can probably see some pros and cons to that, right? So one of the pros is uh, it's a disincentive for abuse of the system if you know you have to lay out some cash up front, even knowing you'll get it back. A big con, of course, is that, well, if you haven't got money, you may not be able to put that cash up front. And there are probably situations where, you know, um, there are provisions for the desperately poor. You have the freedom to choose which doctor to visit, kind of like we have in Canada. But they have this thing called co-payments. So co-payments are common around the world. We don't have that in Canada. A co-payment is when, yes, the insurance pays for your visit, but you got to pay a little bit also. Usually it's like 10, 20 bucks out of pocket for every visit. The reason for co-payments is, uh, the two reasons. First reason is to help offset the cost. But the second and most important reason is it is a disincentive for overuse. In a previous presentation, I mentioned that in Ontario, we have the opportunity to go see your family doctor, a walk-in clinic, the emergency room, all on the same day for the same issue if you don't get the answer you want the first time. So there's a recipe for abuse there. If there's a co-payment, that's a disincentive for abuse. If you know you've got to pay 10 or $20 every time you go see your doctor or the walk-in clinic or the ER, then you're less likely to go there three times a day. So that's the main reason for it. But France has a fairly large co-payment rate. In addition, uh, the majority of French citizens have additional private insurance. And theirs is considered one of the most expensive in the world. It's funded through a payroll tax. So every when you get your, your salary from your employer, a piece of that is taken out, and that funds the healthcare system. And the doctors are paid by the national insurance system. Okay, so it's a it's kind of a, a salary system. Italy is number two. And the Italians actually are dissatisfied with the quality of their care according to the surveys. That's an important takeaway message here because it's possible to have a system that is objectively good and yet the people don't like it, just as it's possible to have a system that is objectively bad and yet the citizens love it. So take that for what it is. Theirs is funded by what's called a regressive payroll tax. That means that depending upon how much you make, you pay a larger percentage of your salary towards um, health care. And the physicians aren't paid a salary, they're paid by a capitation. Remember, capitation means that the physicians are paid for every patient that they see. So if you see more patients, you get paid more. Again, there are pros and cons of that model. There's a strong incentive to see more patients, but there's also a disincentive to spend a lot of time with any one patient. Pros and cons. Much like France, the co-payment rates are high and the waiting times are long, much like in Canada. So with those two examples, I think you can see that they're two quite distinct ways of organizing a healthcare system, both of which are quite different from Canada's situation. So there isn't just one way to give socialized medicine. There are literally scores of different models. How is all this finance, and what are the issues around financing? What are the trends around financing? Well, look at this. Globally, Healthcare has become more expensive. So this graph shows us over time the cost of healthcare as a percentage of a nation's GDP, gross domestic product. So um, clearly the, the trend here is more expensive and there's some ups and downs. And there's a couple of ways of interpreting this. You could say, hey, uh, our healthcare is getting more expensive, or you can say, hey, we are spending more on healthcare. Do you see the difference there? The first one is saying there's something about us that's causing us to spend more money or causing us to need to spend more money. And the second interpretation says, okay, maybe we're richer now so we can spend more money. So maybe with the world getting slightly richer, with the economic miracles of India and China of the last 10, 20 years, they're now rich enough to be able to afford a better healthcare system. So there are two interpretations and I'm not sure which one's true, but do keep in mind there are many ways of looking at these data. This is an old graph, so the numbers have changed significantly. However, the trends have not. This shows us, as a percentage of GDP again, how much various countries spend on healthcare. The takeaway message from this graph is that the United States is really expensive. 
they spend the most amount of money on health care. Canada here, it says, spends about 9% of our GDP. It's probably more like 10, if not greater than 10. All these countries, the price has gone up. But the Americans um, are far and away um, the most uh, spendthrift. Spendthrift, what's the word? They spend a lot of money on their health care. Now, Canada, our costs have been going up as well. So this is a percentage of GDP, healthcare costs. It's been going up almost as a straight line. Um, it does not follow inflation. It exceeds inflation. So our, the growth of our healthcare expenses is greater than what the products actually cause. Now, how much of the financing is actually in private situations rather than public. By private, I mean out of pocket or via private corporations. Public means government <coughs> government funding. So, again, unsurprisingly, if you look at the United States on this list here, they have the most, the largest proportion of their healthcare financing is in the private sphere, which is why in their version of socialized medicine, which is Obamacare right now, uh, it's pretty much privatized. It's a situation where insurance companies are funded by the government to give care based upon their own free market perceptions and perspectives. Here's another way of looking at the rankings of healthcare expenses. This is per person, per capita. Our previous graph was as a percentage of GDP. But even here, the United States is the most expensive. In Canada, we spend uh, from 2009, about 4,000, it's probably about 5,000 now, dollars per person on health care. The Americans, 8,000 and above. And this shows us the trend in per capita spending for a variety of countries over time. This yellow trend line shows us the average of OECD nations. And where's Canada? We're following the average fairly closely. So we're not doing anything unusual or untoward, but the Americans, their healthcare spending is accelerating quite rapidly and faster than most other countries. So we're spending more money on health, and the Americans are spending a lot more money on health. Does more spending mean better health? Now, this is distinct from saying, are richer people healthy? Right? Because we know that wealth is a determinant of health. If you have money, you have access to better care. If you have money, you have access to better food. If you have money, you tend to live a less stressful life. You tend to. There are exceptions, obviously. Um, if you have money, you tend to go on vacation. You have better access to health education. So, as a determinant of health, of course, money is highly associated with better health. But, at a national level, if a nation spends more money on health care, does that mean that its population is going to be healthier? Let's take a look. This shows us life expectancy as a function of health care spending per capita. And each of these points represents a different country. Life expectancy is not a perfect proxy measurement for healthiness, but it's all we have for most of these countries. What we see here is that, yeah, in general, the more money we spend per capita, the more life expectancy we get. That advantage is greatest in the first thousand dollars per capita. Okay, so if you spend nothing, you get nothing in return. If you start spending some money, you get a lot more in return. You spend a little more money, you get a lot more return. But the return on investment starts declining after about two thousand dollars per person. Right. Um, you can, and the more money you spend, you're getting less and less return on investment. Look at the Americans. They spend the most amount of money, and they're not getting the biggest bang for their buck compared to the Scandinavian countries, which spend significantly less, but are getting better life expectancy. So the takeaway message here, I think, is that, yeah, more money does mean better health up to a limit. There comes a point where there are diminishing returns. Let's look at another way. So on this axis, we still have life expectancy, but here, instead of spending per capita, we have spending as a percentage of GDP. It's not so much a curve as a straight line now. 
but the Americans are still the outlier. They're spending a lot of money and not getting as much bang for the buck as you might think. So this suggests that maybe it's not how much you spend, even though spending a lot gets you more, it's how much you spend and how that spending is organized and invested. Because the Americans, being a more privatized, non-socialized healthcare system, the money expended tends to be uh, eaten up in administration and focused on particular subpopulations. As a result, their outcomes are not reflected at the population level as a whole. Maybe it's not so much about how much money you're spending, but how many doctors you have. Well, same thing here. But this axis isn't life expectancy, it's preventable deaths. So you want this to be low. So in general, you want uh, fewer doctors and fewer preventable deaths. And some people pull that off well. So Japan doesn't have a lot of death, but very good health outcomes. The Americans have a lot of doctors and some good health outcomes. Uh, some countries, like uh, UK here, has few doctors, but not that great health outcomes. So the lesson here is, it's unclear. It's unclear. Obviously, you need doctors and other health care workers, but we don't know what the appropriate number is and whether or not that is the rate-limiting step when it comes to getting really good health care. But there is an impression that we need doctors, and as a result, doctors are always welcome into most countries as immigrants. Not always. We, always, we know the, the stereotype of the physician who comes to this country and can't get a license and ends up driving a taxi. But in general, we like to think that this particular skill set is quite welcome because we always need more healthcare workers. So when one country accepts highly trained individuals from another country um, that needs them, we call that the brain drain. We're draining that country of its brain resources. It's the movement of trained people from a place where they're needed to a place with greater resources. So uh, in the case of Canada, we accept doctors from India, um, where it's a poor, as right now it's a poor country, maybe not for much longer, or from African nations that are poor countries and need their doctors. So that would be considered draining of their brains. In healthcare, the brain drain talks about healthcare professionals moving from places of scarcity to places of, uh, of wealth. You can have brain drain within a country as well as between countries. We have brain drain right here in Canada where highly trained people move from the Maritimes where there are fewer opportunities to Toronto and Vancouver and Calgary where there are more opportunities. Why do highly trained individuals, particularly healthcare workers, move? Well, the obvious answer is remuneration, salary, right? We all know about that. You go where the money is. But also, you can go someplace for better living conditions. In particular, if your country is under war, you will travel for better security for yourself and your family. As well, you'll travel to a place if they offer more opportunity for families. Right? So maybe the education system in your country isn't great and you have a preteen child that needs an education. So you move a place where the schools are better. And lastly, intellectual wastage. So maybe as a highly trained professional, you don't feel your country gives you enough opportunity to fully express the fullness of your professional capacity. And you want to go to a place where you can do research or do different kinds of procedures or work with better mentors. All those great things. So this shows us the countries that receive the most doctors and nurses. So right here we have the OECD average for nurses and doctors, and the countries over here have a higher proportion of foreign-born nurses and doctors, and these countries have a, um, a lower percentage of, for, of uh, doctors and nurses. So Canada and the USA have a higher than average number of foreign-born nurses and doctors. Where are they coming from? It won't surprise you to see that most nurses in OECD countries come from the Philippines. In fact, there's an argument to be made that um, nurses are an export commodity of the Philippines, where they'll train their nurses specifically to work in the American healthcare environment for export purposes. Whereas doctors, the majority overwhelmingly, come from India. 
India exports doctors. But what about quality of care? So remember, when we talked about the WHO study, I mentioned that one of the indicators they did not look at was quality of care. But the Commonwealth Fund did do a study ranking healthcare systems by quality of care. And they define quality of care as quality, access, efficiency, and equity. So this is their ranking. So uh, this top row here shows us the actual ranking number that they landed upon. And their system, the UK, has the best healthcare system. Canada barely makes the top 10, which is not bad, to be honest. 10 is better than 30. And the US makes 11. So they're shut out the top 10 again. This is another way of looking at that ranking. The, um, the best two were the UK and Switzerland, and the worst two was Canada and the US amongst the countries they looked at. So let's summarize. There are many ways to organize a healthcare system. They've all got pros and cons. Some have co-pays, some have doctors being paid in different ways, some have long waiting lists, short waiting lists, some are more privatized than others. And the quality of your healthcare system does matter. It matters in lots of ways. Here's an example you haven't, probably haven't thought of. There was a situation once where a Japanese car company was trying to decide where to open its new manufacturing plant, in Windsor or in Detroit. They chose Windsor, not necessarily because of any qualities of Windsor society, but because if their workers were in Ontario, it would cost them less in health care than if their workers were in Michigan, because Ontario has socialized medical care. And as a result, they wouldn't have to pay out of pocket for their employees' medical care. So a health care system can be a competitive advantage for a nation, as well as a boon for its individuals. Spending more money does not necessarily result in a better health for the population. It does at a certain level, but there comes a point where you get minimizing returns on investment. So at that point, it's not so much about how much you're spending, but how you're spending it, where you're spending it. Having more healthcare workers does not necessarily result in better health. It helps, but it's not the right limiting step. There are many ways to assess the quality of a healthcare system. So we uh, had a brief talk about uh, which indicators to use. Satisfaction, population measurements of mortality and disease prevalence, uh, cost, accessibility, those kinds of things. It comes down to what you care about. Right? So uh, depending on your values, you will choose a different indicator to measure those particular values. And lastly, funding these systems is an enormous challenge, and nobody's figured it out. So in Ontario, we spend about half of our budget on healthcare systems. Um, the best systems in the world are still running deficits and debts. So if you think you know of a way to better finance the healthcare system, then my friend, you have an excellent career ahead of you. I will stop there. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.